Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll speak with representatives of the state's local governments on what cities and towns expect from the upcoming legislative session. And we'll discuss the impact of fake news on the credibility of journalism. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. For the first time in 24 years, Maricopa County has a new sheriff. I, Paul Penzone, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona, and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona. Paul Penzone was sworn in this morning during a public ceremony at the County Board of Supervisors meeting. Penzone took the oath with his wife and his son at his side. Penzone was among more than a dozen county officials sworn in today, including Adrian Fontes, the new county recorder who defeated longtime incumbent Helen Purcell. After the swearing in ceremony, Denny Barney took over as chairman of the Board of Supervisors and addressed the lawsuit filed yesterday by the Arizona Diamondbacks. The team is suing the county to break its lease at Chase Field. Uh, we were certainly disappointed by the lawsuit that was, uh, that was dropped yesterday, but, the, but we, we have to remember that the Diamondbacks are a great asset to the downtown community, to the county, and to the state, and we need to find a way to keep them playing in Chase Field through the, uh, through the end of the original term. This week, we've been hearing from leaders and advocates of various issues on what they're hoping to see from the upcoming state legislative session, which begins next week. Tonight, we look at the legislative priorities of Arizona's cities, towns, and counties. Joining us now is the mayor of Chandler and president of the League of Arizona Cities and Towns, Jay Tib Schraney, and Lake Havasu City Mayor and vice president of the League of Arizona Cities and Towns, Mark Nexon, good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Uh, Mayor, what do you want to see from the legislature this go-around? Well, it's going to be an interesting year. I've uh, been making the rounds with the, uh, the speaker, the new speaker that's coming in, the new president of the Senate. Also, I've had two meetings with the governor. So I think initially we're trying to have a, a good communication lines open uh, because you know, you get into the session and there's always a bill or two or three or four or five that you sometimes have problems with. And I just want to have, be able to have the opportunity to say, hey, we got a problem with this or we like this and, and have some good communication. So not sure what this session's going to be hold, hold, but I'm going to remain very optimistic. I think there's an opportunity for us to have a good session, but we're going to have to work hard and hopefully minimize any bills that would affect our core principles. And what do you expect or what do you hope to see from the legislature? Well, I, I think Jay's right. What we really want is just that line of communication. I work with our representatives pretty regularly and really the only request is if something comes up that thinks that you think is going to impact our constituents because we have the same constituents, then let's talk about it and, and figure out a way that we can uh, work through it. From a rural perspective, because uh, you're out there in Lake Havasu City, uh, Chandler, a, a different animal mm -hmm. altogether, uh, how do you make all this work? Well, uh, you just do. Uh, the, you know, for, from our perspective, being in a rural area, particularly the fact that uh, we're fairly remote, as we were talking, uh, next towns are pretty much 60 miles away. So we really have to rely on ourselves. But having said that, we put together those three cities, Bullhead City, Kingman, and Lake Havasu City, and formed the Tri-City Council. So now we're speaking for mm -hmm. that area in one voice, mm -hmm. and we make regular visits to the, the legislature. I know that uh, Senate Bill 1487, SB 1487, uh, this is a biggie as far as cities and towns are concerned. Uh, you want this thing repealed. Tell us about the law, what it does, and why you're against it. 1487 was a law that passed uh, last year and went into effect, and it basically is where anybody from the legislature can file a complaint against the city if they think they're violating the law. And it uh, basically lets the, uh, has to go through a process, but it can uh, 
impact and take your state shared revenues away, which is a significant amount of money. Obviously, we oppose that bill because there's already a mechanism in place. I mean, if a city was doing something that somebody perceived as violating the law, there's the court system, and you could already go through the court system with them. So we thought the bill, we think the bill is unconstitutional. It's overreaching, and it's unnecessary. We are in litigation on it. It's uh, going through a process right now. The the city that got challenged was Tucson on uh, the gun law that they have. And so we're uh, optimistic that we will get that bill uh, overturned by the courts. And that's where we're at right now on it is the, in the courts. And uh, again, when you're talking shared, 15% of the shared revenue uh, would be affected here for a city or a town that would be found in violation here. The governor says, though, he wants to ensure, and he was pretty emphatic about this mm -hmm. on his last State of the State speech, uh, emphatic about the fact that you can't have patchwork laws in various cities around the state. Does he have a point? Well, I, I think he does have a point, but this isn't the way to to uh, hammer that point, if you will. We already have a mechanism. Mm -hmm. Jay's right. We, we have a court system, and um, it's just this is so overreaching because it isn't just a legislature um, or a legislator dealing with his or her own city. It could, could be a legislator from Lake Havasu upset with what's going on in Bisbee. Yeah. So that's, it, it's just overreaching. We have laws in place. We can, uh, we can work through the system. And we, again, we would like to see it repealed. Yeah, and it doesn't really allow for if somebody wants to make frivolous claims against the city, they can. There's a whole process then that that city would be on the receiving end of. So we, uh, we don't like it, it and it kind of changes the whole way the system works in terms of you've got the AG who now kind of acts as a judge preliminarily, and the AG is, is not a judge. So we think there's a lot of constitutional issues with it. We're uh, going through this right now in t with the city of Tucson. We've joined that suit, and we're hoping to get a, a remedy to it from the courts. I know the lawmakers that push this through say that penalties are needed to keep cities from violating state law. And uh, w with that in mind, and the idea is that you know cities and counties and towns are subdivisions of the state, and they want to make sure that's the why is there such a disconnect, do you think, between some lawmakers and cities and towns? You know, people were asking me about that, and that's kind of been historic in the state. There's always been a, a thing between the legislature and cities. Is it worse today? You know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But even when I went down there, you know, 13, 14 years ago, there was that. And even talking with people that... Uh, that were there before I was, they had that same issue. But you look at some of what's going on nationally, very similar to what's going on in Arizona, where local governments and state governments are clashing over whatever the issue is, and there's legislation. So again, that's last year. We're going to deal with last year in the courts. I think I've had the discussion with the governor's office, and I know I, the speaker and I talked a bit about it speaker coming in. So we'll see where that goes. But we want to focus on this year and what we can do to, and we have a lot of common ground, a lot of common ground with the legislature. I would imagine some of that common ground includes economic development. What are you, what are you hoping to see from the legislature as far as that is concerned from a rural perspective? Well, from a rural perspective, um, you know, when we talked to the governor today, for instance, uh, he, he's interested in bringing uh, economic development to Arizona as a whole, and as he puts it, he's agnostic whether it, where it mm -hmm. locates. From a rural perspective, we have a challenge, um, particularly in Lake Havasu City, because we really don't have much of a workforce. The average age in our city is 53 years old. The average age in the nation is 37. So we have to figure out a way to deal with that. And the way we're dealing with it is actually taking the companies that we already have in place 68% of our companies in Lake Havasu City have five or fewer employees, and we're showing them how to expand and hire more people. And as far as an urban perspective is concerned, I mean, Chandler obviously growing a big tech sector down there. What right. do you, what do you, what, how can the legislature help you along with right. keeping basic services up and operational? Yeah, and I think this is where we have that common ground to where we can start this year on a really good, good track. All of the legislature and the governor's office agrees economic development is a really good thing. And I think we can work together on that, whether it be on uh, transportation and making sure we have proper transportation funding or even talking about how we administer and go after projects. Because 
There are a lot of companies leaving California. We are primed to get those companies. And so we just have to work together. We, uh, the league, hosted some site selectors, uh, three site selectors who work with corporations that are relocating facilities or headquarters. And we t they talked about things that you can do. We as cities can do, and we as the state and the legislature can do. So there's some opportunities to work with the legislature to re refine how we go after companies and how we work our economic development efforts. We have to partner. We, the, the cities and the, and the state, we have to partner to be successful. And I feel like we've really done well, just in my community alone, working with Commerce and the governor's office. We've been able to secure some things, and that's because we've all work together. So if we can kind of collaborate that way, I think that's a start. So, so uh, economic development, critical. We have to work together and we can do it. They control a lot of those issues. How about additional financing tools for things like infrastructure? I, I would imagine it's needed in Lake Havasu City like everywhere else. Well, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously we like to see the highway user revenue funds being restored. Um, that is a significant portion of uh, of the monies that we have available to maintain our roads. Explain quickly what happened to those funds. Uh, for the most part, they've been swept um, to balance budgets at the state level. And uh, while we uh, understood, understand that, as the state is getting, is better off in the economy, we'd like to see some of the those funds be restored to where they belong. As for, and those are the HERF funds, but, yeah, there's it, but the other HERF financing and, tools as well, correct? I, the, I think what uh, Mark's referring to, though, is the HERF and the state highway funds. About a billion has been swept since right. 2000, and I was down there for part of that time. We have to wean ourselves away from those sweeps because we have to put money into transportation. One thing we heard loud and clear when we talked to the folks locating their facilities or their headquarters here was they felt our tax structure was pretty good and, and very uh, competitive but they talked about quality of life, they talked about transportation. So the transportation sweeps, if we can minimize those, put those into the roads, especially the rural folks. Here in the county, we've been able to have our propositions that have helped fund the freeways and the roads, but the rural areas don't have that same ability. So we have to give them that, because that's gonna help not only our current residents, but the businesses that say, I got to see that you're investing in your transportation. And real quickly, I know economic development, you're pretty optimistic on that. Infrastructure for transportation, are you optimistic on that? We're always optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, um, I am. I, I, I think um, as time goes on, we'll see things get back to, to normal. Um, but in the meantime, we do our best with the, the monies that we have. All right. Good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. We certainly Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. The term fake news is appearing a lot in the wake of the recent elections, with many concerned that fabricated stories are adding to a declining credibility of news. Here now to discuss fake news and its ramifications for the mainstream press is Phil Boas, the Arizona Republic's editorial page director, and Julia Wallace, the Frank Russell Chair of Journalism at ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Good to have you both here. Great Thanks to be for joining here. us. Thank you. Phil, give me a definite. What, 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 fake news, what does that mean? Well, fake news is <clears throat> news that is actually fabricated, that is uh, knowingly false when it's published. 
and it's been around forever. And we really began to see it in journalism with email. It would, it, you know, people would share email where these fake stories would come across, and you'd have to send people to sources, tell them, no, that's not real, and whatnot. But it's become very sophisticated now, where you might have state actors who are producing it, trying to get ultra-nationalist uh, candidates elected, maybe in the United States, definitely in Europe, uh, Western Europe. And, um, and it's become sophisticated because of the tools of the internet, which have really democratized uh, publishing and made it possible for anybody to create an audience and have publishing tools to look real and yeah. authentic. And, 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 and indeed, it has become more sophisticated, but still, why are people believing these things? Okay, you've been to a grocery store. You see the National Enquirer. Do you read it? Well, I look at it, but yeah. I don't read it. I don't, I mean, I don't page turn. Well, a, but a lot of people do, right? It's interesting. You know, the, re the reason fake news has taken off is they figured out what people want to read and what's interesting. I mean, there's guys in Macedonia sitting there trying to think of, oh, what will make people click on this? And so they're motivated by maybe agenda. They're motivated by money. They make money on those clicks. But they're not thinking about, have I verified this? They're not thinking about, is it true? They're thinking about, oh, is it interesting that I'm going to get you to read that aliens have maybe invaded our Earth? But you're only going to, and especially with the Internet, you're only going to get me to read it if I click it. And yes. I'm only going to click it if I, I would hope I have some reasonable expectation of accuracy here. Or are you saying that simply doesn't exist? People see a headline straight out of, of uh, you know, the Facebook or something, and boom, they're gone. I think, as, as Phil says, social media has exacerbated the issue because what happens is a friend forwards it to you and that gives it a certain validity. So you think, oh, well, if Phil sent it to me, maybe it's true. And so that has really accelerated this issue. Is that what we're talking Because, I mean, again, if I see it in the Arizona Republic, I'm thinking, all right, we're, we're, we're talking about something here. Yeah. But if I see it in, the, in the, the daily wazoo, whatever, I'm thinking, you got to... Shouldn't you? I mean, aren't people being a or is that the problem? There is no no discrimination anymore. No. Well, the the problem is that we have a large segment of Americans who lack critical thinking skills, and so they're not discerning. They're not they're not figuring out for themselves. Think of one of the most popular fake news stories this election cycle was that the Democrats were going to. Um, do a radiological strike on the election system to shut down voting, okay? Now, if, if you believe that, you know, this isn't a media problem. This, right. is about, this is an education problem and a, a critical thinking problem. It's also a polarized electorate, a polarized citizenry problem, correct? That's, that's a part of it. That's a big part of it because there is an effort to try to sway opinion that is going on with this as well. It's, there, as Julia noted, there are a lot of people doing it to make money. They're just doing it for clicks and they don't care how you vote. There are people who care about your vote. And especially in Europe, in Western Europe, you're, you're seeing uh, ultra-nationalist actors who are putting this stuff out, trying to sway elections and the electorate. And, and so the governments are, are responding to that now. Yeah, I think anyone who wants to read about a seven-headed baby from Mars can, can go ahead and have a right. great old time about it. Right. But when you're talking about a, a gunman who addresses what he thought was the Clintons running some sort of nefarious operation in the back room of some place in Washington. I mean, these people are believing this. What's going on out there? Well, I think that there's a bigger issue here, and that goes to the media credibility issue. Um, you know, I wish that they would say, oh, well, if it's in the Arizona Republic or the New York Times, I believe it. But the reality is that's no longer true. Why? Why is that no longer true? I think it's a couple reasons. I think, number one, there is a bias against institutions, all institutions. Pew does a survey every year in which they look at credibility of institutions. They're all at record lows, including the media. But I think the media also has to get its house in order, that we've done a lot of things to disenfranchise huge parts of our communities. You know, the, the, you know, the conservative parts of the country, the rural parts of the country, they don't believe us anymore. And we've got to figure out how to get our house in order to fix that. Why, why don't those areas, in Arizona included, uh, believe in the mainstream media anymore? Well, um, I mean, the distrust in the media is nothing new. That's been around a long time. And as a conservative and as a Republican, 
which I'm, I'm from the opinion side of journalism, so I can say that. But I've noticed for a while, I saw bias in media for many, many years. I mean, the Republicans were noticed it a long, long time ago. It's nothing new. It's been there. But I'm also, as a conservative, I'm able to discern between the New York Times and some goofy email that I got from a lost uncle, you know, um, you know, who thinks they're little men on Mars. I can, I can actually understand that there is validity, greater validity to what, you know, a large news organization with professional standards is going to put out, you know. But yes, people distrust the media. I don't think it's a bad thing that people distrust the media, mainstream media. I think it's a good thing. I think you should distrust distrust everything you read, not distrust, but to have doubt and to be skeptical about everything. And if, we teach reporters to, sure. to don't trust no one, you right, know, right. go and find and ferret out the truth, you know, but go to a lot of sources and, and until you feel like you understand the truth. So. And yet, as a conservative Republican, mm -hmm. um, you've got Donald Trump basically saying, I, Mainstream media is fake. It's all fake. You've got Rush Limbaugh saying the mainstream media, drive-by media, whatever he wants to call it, is, is simply making stuff up. And a lot of people believe that, whether it's true or not. And I, I would hope that the papers of record are not making things up. Yeah. Well, I've been in the business long enough, and it is a business that's, it, it, it tends to swing left. It attracts more liberals than conservatives. It always has. But where there are professional standards, there is a real effort to try to get to the truth. And, and we make mistakes. We do all the time. I mean, we do make mistakes. And, and our, sometimes our judgment is off. But every day we're working and we're trying to aim for a standard. But a mistake is, seems to me at least to be different than fake news than fabricated stories or, or am I am I off base there so I I guess I think that there are several problems that mainstream media has and as Phil notes it's been going on for 20 years the bias issue the the concerns about media are nothing new but there I think a few issues they need to address one of them and we'll probably disagree on this Phil is uh -huh. um, I think that newspapers trying to say we're objective and then endorsing candidates is a problem that people don't understand it um, I was the editor of the Atlanta newspaper for uh, almost a decade, and we stopped doing endorsements in 2009 because we felt like we wanted to be nonpartisan, we wanted to be objective, and that our readers didn't understand how we could do that and endorse. So I think if you want to be the, like the papers in, in Britain and say you're the Guardian and we have an agenda and that's going to be everywhere, great. But if you're going to say we are straight down the middle, it's tough to endorse. So, so people aren't buying the fact that the mainstream media is straight down the middle? Absolutely not. If they're not buying that fact, and if you're reporting X and Rush Limbaugh is saying Y, they're believing Y, when you know X is true, we got a problem there, don't we? Yeah, we, we have a problem and it's called freedom, okay? And it's freedom of speech and, and it's messy. And there's, you know, the guy who has no standards, he has the same right to get out there on social media now with greater wattage than he's ever had before to say fake stuff. And he will. And he's going to have, you know, and we have to respect that freedom. It's there. There's always going to be stuff that, you know, is, is going to be said that we don't like and we don't agree with. Well, but I think that there's a difference between what someone doesn't like and what someone doesn't agree with was something that is just blatantly false and may incite someone to take a rifle up to Washington looking for Hillary Clinton, correct? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, but I would be careful not to say, you know, I mean, that guy had problems and there are all sorts well, of people I, yes. with problems who yes. do all sorts of violent acts that, yeah. you know, are sort of unrelated. I, I mean, I, I guess what I would say is, yes, there are problems with fake news. But there's also problems with mainstream media. And unless, you know, what I worry about is unless mainstream media addresses some of those issues effectively, we get in more and more trouble as fake news becomes bigger and bigger. So is the credibility of news in general, critical, journalism, is, critical. Is, is, is it, well, is it threatened right now because of these kinds of things? Absolutely. Do you agree with that? I, it, what, is, what is threatened by is that there's an attitude out there that 
truth is relative. It's what you think it is. Mm -hmm. And so there's an effort to try to muddy up um, fact and truth and, and so that people don't believe mainstream sources. That's a, that's a threat to us. But the stuff that Julia's talking about, we were talking like that 40 years ago, you know, nearly 40 years ago when I first got in this mm -hmm. business, you know, the, about the problems in journalism. Uh, to your point about editorials, editorials, we have a long tradition of an opinion side of journalism and a separation. I give Americans credit for being able to discern between the difference between the two. I think they understand it. All right. Great discussion. Good to have you both here. Great. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Thursday on Arizona Horizon, education advocates talk about their expectations for the upcoming legislative session. And we'll meet the city of Phoenix's first poet laureate. It's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Want to be more informed? Arizona PBS delivers news and analysis with multiple perspectives, thanks to financial support from you and Friendship Village Tempe, a retirement community for over 30 years, offers independent living with residency options, lifelong learning classes,